In the beginning was the great I am. I am who I am. There is only one who speaks creation into being. There is only one who holds all things together by his will and dwells in unapproachable light. Everything is from him and through him and to him. There is only one who knows all, is ever present and unlimited in power. There is only one who is eternal, limitless, never changing. In him there is no variation or shifting shadow. With him, all things are possible. There is only one king over all, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. I am who I am. Yahweh, the name of God. In the Old Testament, there are a number of times where God himself attaches a, an attribute to his name. Yahweh Yireh. God who provides. Yahweh Rapha, God who heals. Declaring his character, what he is like. And in the Gospel of John, Jesus does something similar. Seven I am statements. Declaring that he is the great I am. Revealed in the Son of God. Describing who he is and why he came. This morning, we begin that series through the seven I am statements in John. So turn with me in your Bible to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Find about verse 26 and hold your spot there. This morning, we have the awesome privilege of taking the Lord's Supper together. And you need to know and understand that the entire service is moving towards that moment, that we would listen with great anticipation, asking God to speak to our hearts. We never want to take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. How special is it going to be for those three who were just baptized to take the Lord's Supper for their very first time? Now, before we get there, this passage is... Uh, there's a theological correction that I need to address so that you can have that in mind. We can clear that up before we ever get there. So when I speak to the passage, I can just speak with clarity. There is Roman Catholic theology called transubstantiation that some would see this passage is talking about. Now, Roman Catholics believe that when they take the Lord's Supper, that the elements literally become the body and blood of Christ. That God does a supernatural work, that there is miraculous thing that takes place, and that grace is being dispensed through the elements, okay? I wanna point to you why uh, I believe pretty clearly this passage is not teaching that, that that would be a wrong understanding of what's taking place here. Primarily, look at verse 35. And what you need to know and understand is that when Jesus uh, speaks in this passage, he, he's going to use a metaphor. He's going to explain that metaphor up front. And then at the end, he's going to use some very strong, absolute language. But it's important to know and understand that he has already defined the metaphor ahead of time. Look at verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. You see, he's already defined at the beginning that coming and believing is what he means by this metaphor of hungering and thirsting. In fact, he continues that throughout. If you look at verse 40, there he also says, who beholds the Son and believes in him, again defined. And then he, he, he 
uh, pushes that further in verses 47 and 48, where he again says, believes, I am the bread of life. So that by the time he gets down to the absolute language, he's already defined those terms, okay? I just wanted to clear that up so that as we walk through it, now you'll actually see as we walk through the text why he presses the metaphor so hard. So listen as I read. We're gonna begin in John uh, 6, beginning in verses 26 and 27. Listen as I read. Jesus answered and said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him the Father God has set his seal. Now look at verse 35 again. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, as we come to an incredible passage and movement of Scripture, where you, Jesus Christ, have declared your name and give vivid descriptions of why you came. Father, we pray that you would give us ears to hear your voice, that you would speak to us in an incredible way. God, that you would do what only you could do, that you would stir our hearts from death to life, to be able to walk with you, that we would have hearts that beat for you and know you. Father, I pray that if there is anyone here today that does not know you, that they would hear your voice, and that you would call them to eternal life. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen. Point number one in the text, Jesus is offering you more than you could ever imagine. Jesus is offering you far more than you could ever imagine. You see, Jesus has been teaching and performing many signs throughout the region of Galilee. As his ministry begin, uh, continues to grow and gain attention, the day prior to this, 5,000 men listened to him teach upon a hillside there in Galilee. 5,000 men. That means if you see the size of this crowd, it had to be at least 10,000 men, women, and children. As darkness approached, Jesus was filled with compassion because most of them hadn't eaten a thing all day long. This would be the setting of his widest viewed miracle. As he turned a young boy's lunch into a feast that allowed the masses of the people to eat and eat their fill and there was still stuff left over at the end. If we are honest, oftentimes when we're reading our Bible and we know about the Jesus feeding of the 5,000 miracle, we almost view it as a party trick. I mean, it, we may scratch our heads a little bit. Why is this the miracle that is in all four Gospels? I happen to think that is because almost none of us have experienced genuine hunger. I mean, our pantries overflow with food. In fact, we will throw out stuff because we don't get around to eating it. Truth of the matter is praise God for our affluence and the way that technology has moved forward. But you must understand that in the ancient world, they only ate meat on very special occasions. They had no idea what the concept of what is your favorite snack food is. 90% of their wages went to daily provisions just feeding the family. So when Jesus says, I am the bread of life, it doesn't quite stick in our ears because we think of 
H-E-B and the 50 different bread choices and whether you want whole grain and whether you want uh, little nuts mixed in there and all that stuff. But bread was a staple, often with very little else to go with it. My bubble was burst when I spent some time in India and learned that the poor there eat rice and dal, which is like a lentil, for every meal of every day. And that's actually a pattern for a large, large portion of the world. So for this crowd to hear Jesus teach all day and there in one miracle to perform something that met everybody's daily need for food, I mean, that was a big deal. So so even though he had crossed over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, huge numbers of that crowd got into boats and pursued him until they found him in Capernaum. But Jesus looks at them and says, you're here for the wrong reasons. You aren't here because you were stirred by God. Rather, you're here because you want more bread. You love the gift not the giver. Now, naturally, they engage Jesus in a dialogue, and they say, wait, wait, wait a second here, right? Uh, Moses uh, performed a miracle of manna coming from the ground. They, he, he fed Israelites uh, every day, right? And, and one greater than Moses, if you're the Messiah, right, that should be part of the deal, right? If you do that, we'll we'll believe you, we'll follow you. But Jesus presses them because their categories are too small. They're too worldly. You see, it's not that he's not compassionate. He already fed the masses. And it's not that Jesus isn't willing to meet people where they are in the mess of life. You see, just a chapter before, he healed a man who was paralyzed for more than 30 plus years before he ever addressed him about sin. He healed him. But the food of this world only lasts a few hours. And even though this crippled man was healed, years later, he would die. Jesus presses their categories because he wants to give them so much more than short-term fixes. You see, the manna pointed to him. He is the true bread that came down out of heaven from his father. He satisfies spiritual hunger. He quenches spiritual thirst He gives real, lasting, spiritual contentment. Eternal life is found in him. You see, those who ate of the manna in the Old Testament, they eventually died. But Jesus is offering bread unto eternal life. He is the fulfillment of Isaiah 55. Listen as I read this scripture. Of God pleading with man. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. All you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money for that which is not bread? And your wages for that which is not satisfied. Listen carefully to me and eat what is good. Delight yourself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you. You see, Jesus is offering them more than they could ever imagine. And he offers the same to you. Listen to me. Friend, your greatest need is spiritual need. Genuine peace 
and contentment that is found in God alone, through his son, Jesus Christ alone. Every other chasing that you do in your life will ultimately lead you discontent, not satisfied, until you come to him and learn that he is the bread of life. Now, as a Christian, this does not mean that you don't need to come back to Jesus again and again. Rather, it means that the core hunger, the core thirst, the core emptiness is filled in Jesus. Christopher Parkning, considered by many as the world's greatest classical guitarist, he achieved his musical dreams by the age of 30. By then, he was also a world-class fly fisherman. However, his success failed to bring him happiness. Weary of performances and recording sessions, Parkning bought a ranch and gave up the guitar. But instead of finding happiness, he only found that it increased his emptiness. He wrote, if you arrive at the point in your life where you have everything that you've ever wanted and you thought that that would make you happy and it still doesn't, you begin to question everything. It's as if you have the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow and then you say, well, what's next? Well, while visiting friends, he attended a church service just like this and he found Jesus Christ. And he heard the scripture. He was struck by 1 Corinthians 10, 31 that says, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And he realized that he could fly fish and he could play his guitar and he could do it for the glory of God. That those were good things, that those were gifts that the Lord had given him. But first, he had to come to Jesus. Now, he says, I have learned the true secret, and have genuine happiness in life. Friend, I share the exact same testimony with you. I share this with everything inside of me, that I have true peace, true joy, true contentment, because I've placed my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That he is the longing of my heart, there is a fountain who is a king, a victorious warrior, and he's Lord of everything. Amen. He's my rock, my shelter, my very own, the blessed redeemer who reigns upon the throne. Amen. And the greatest longing of my life is I know there is a day when I will see him face to face. I pray that you know that too. Secondly, they have approached the utterly sovereign king, but Jesus isn't interested in negotiating the terms. Look at verses 36 through 38. <clears throat> but I say to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. That's Jesus talking to them. He flat out says, you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but to do the, the will of him who sent me. <clears throat> if you are to view Jesus' ministry from an earthly perspective, this next move that he makes makes absolutely no sense. Back in verse 15, earlier in the chapter, after he had performed the feeding of the 5,000, the scripture says Jesus knew that they were about to take him and make him king by force. They were so excited about him, they wanted to make him king. But Jesus slips off and goes the other way. Now they found him. They've chased him down. I mean, think about this. How's this for starting a movement, trying to convince the world that you're the Messiah? You have 10,000 people who are ready and willing to do whatever you want and go wherever you want, right there. 
But as they approach him, Jesus presses the conversation. He distances himself from their terms and demands. He keeps them an arm's length away throughout the entire dialogue. And he speaks to them with an authority that only God himself could speak. In fact, because his words are truth, his very words are drawing some to life and others to unbelief and death. When you study the passage and you look at verses 63 through 65, you, you realize the implication is, is saying exactly what he says in John 8, 45. Because I speak the truth, you do not believe. It is because Jesus states words of truth that is actually causing the divide within man, causing some to unbelief. You see, he could placate them. He could speak with a softness so as at the end to have everyone like him, as we often do, under their conditions, their terms. But Jesus is not asking for permission. He's telling us the way that it is. You see, he is from eternity and he speaks the words of eternal life. Jesus' words here are worthy of your thoughtful contemplation as he wades through the deep complexity of God's sovereignty in regards to salvation. All that he does, his entire reason for coming is to do his Father's will. You can't even come to him unless the Father draws you. And if the Father draws you, you will come and you will hear his voice and you will be taught by him and you will learn from him. And he will keep you and raise you up on the final day. You see, his claim of authority is shocking to our independent, man-centered palate. The God the Father and Son and Spirit will move and act and accomplish everything according to his will unto that day. That around the throne at the end of time, every nation, tribe, and tongue will be represented there that day. And who will bring it about? Who will make certain that all is accomplished? God himself will. God has guaranteed it, that there will be a redeemed. There is no groveling, there is no pleading the terms, there is no give and take. With a crowd of 10,000 that is willing to follow Jesus under their terms, if he would just perform that miracle again for them. His words of truth divide. Verse 60 says that they are difficult to hear. And in fact, the masses will with, withdraw from him. They will refuse to walk after him anymore. Verse 66. How's that for quelching momentum? Right? You're going to be the Messiah. You're going to bring, usher in the kingdom of God. Don't you need people? You got 10,000 right here. <coughs> and he runs them off. And then in verse 67, he turns to the 12 disciples and says to them, are you going to? To which Peter says, one of the most incredible statements in all of scripture that resonates in every Christian's heart, where else can we go? You have the words of eternal life. <coughs> You see, Jesus is the bread of life. He's come down out of heaven. He is offering you more than you could ever imagine. But he's not negotiating the terms. And number three, 
You need his death as a starving man needs bread. Look at verses 53 through 55. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourself. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. This is where the crowd gets completely turned off by him. You see, the day before, they saw an advantageous situation, someone to help with their daily provision. But they generally thought of themselves as pretty good people, right? I mean, they are able to do the good works of God. They say that in verse 28. This is why Jesus presses them. This is why his statements divide. Because Jesus insists on the severity of the situation. Verse 51, I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. <coughs> if anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I give for the life of the world is my flesh. You see, what Jesus insists upon is that the whole world is in need of his flesh. The whole world needs him. There's something plain and obvious that an agrarian society knows but eludes us because of our modern convenience. That is this truth. Everything you eat had to die for you to eat it. Fruits, vegetables, the meat of animals died so that you could live. Bread is made from the grain that is crushed and, and pummeled down into a flour for our nutrients so that we could live. It dies or you do. Similar to a medical emergency where you have a terminal heart disease that requires a heart transplant or you die. You see, the only way you live is if someone else dies. <clears throat> this is the audacity of what Jesus is saying about man and his sinful condition separated from God. This is the severity that drives everyone away. This is what he means when he says, I am the bread of life, that you have to eat my flesh or you will die. I have to die so that you don't have to die. You see, he's pointing to the cross that our sin situation is terminal. It's desperate. It's so much more pressing than even any earthly hunger that you could have. As it says in Isaiah 53, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Friend, I ask you this morning, can you hear his voice his voice calling you to eternal life. Has there been a moment when you have heard the Spirit of God move and call you, show you your desperate need because your sin has separated you from a holy God and that you need the Son of God to die on your behalf and that you are so desperate to have him you are like a starving man in need of bread. And you've heard the words of eternal life. I am the bread of life. That's the offer. That's Jesus' statement, the declaration of who he is. We invite you this morning to move towards the Lord's Supper. 
The fact that we get to take this together as a family. Go ahead and prepare the bread and listen as I talk to you. As this entire passage has moved this morning towards this very moment where we take this little piece of bread as a remembrance of Jesus' body. By the way, if you didn't get an element, if you just raise your hand, we've got deacons coming around. Jesus has given this as a picture. How awesome is it? Is that we got to witness baptism this morning? The picture of the death and resurrection. And now we get to take the Lord's Supper together. The picture of his broken body. Scripture tells us that this is for born again believers who've been baptized. For those who've placed their faith in Jesus Christ. Otherwise, guys, this is just a little cracker to you. But for those of us that believe, we take this very seriously. Amen. Scripture tells us, don't even take it in an unworthy manner. What it means to take it in a worthy manner is to contemplate your sin, what it cost the Savior, and to remember that. To give testimony by faith as you take it and say, you know what, Jesus? You died so that I could live. I need you like a starving man needs bread. You fill my soul. You're everything to me. So I'll give you a few moments and then we'll take it together. While they were eating, Jesus took some bread and after a blessing, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples and he said, take, eat. This is my body. Next, we have the cup. Would you go ahead and prepare the cup? And then listen to me. What is clearly a picture of his blood. You know, it was spilled out that day at the foot of the cross. A spear thrust into his side as his blood poured out all around an altar. The altar of God for the sins of the world, for your sins, for my sins. You know, the incredible truth is that Jesus never leaves us in our sin. He calls us to fall on our knees and to cry out, grace, 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 it is all for grace. But then he tells us as his sons and daughters to stand to our feet and to go forth in joy because you've been set free. So before we take this, I'll give you a few moments to contemplate. What I want you to contemplate is the absolute forgiveness that's found in the blood of Jesus Christ, that it is finished. That the Father is satisfied that no one can bring a charge against you because Jesus Christ has declared you forgiven and free.
when he had taken cup and given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we kneel at the foot of the cross. We cry out, thank you. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. It is more than enough. You satisfy. Forgive us, Jesus, for always chasing after the wrong things, for, for placing them first above you, for loving the gift instead of the giver first. Give us hearts that ring true. Allow us to sit and be established in the weight of what is ultimately true, and that is that you are the greatest gift. You are the one who satisfies above every other thing. You are the bread of life, and we need you. We want to walk worthy of you. King Jesus, if there is anyone here that does not know you, I pray right now they cry out in their heart with faith. They put their trust in you. And they declare, I need you, Jesus. As a poor man needs bread, I need you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.